Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. It's no surprise that COVID-19 has changed every business, but how it's changed businesses varies dramatically according to the company. Fortunately, we are seeing some interesting themes and some interesting opportunities that really span across companies. So today's session, we're gonna to talk to three different companies that have had three different experiences and look at what some of the opportunities, challenges, and consistencies across these companies are. And I'm thrilled to be here today with three amazing presenters that have very different stories about how they embraced the challenges that COVID-19 created and turned it into opportunity. To get started, I'd like to introduce Dr. Albert Chan. He is the Vice President and Chief of Digital Patient Experience at Sutter Health. Following Dr. Chan, we have Sean Flaherty, who is the Head of Technical Services, the Kraft Heinz Company. And rounding out our panelists today, we have Jennifer Brent, the Director of Business Operations and Strategic Planning for Global Real Estate at HPE. Thank you everybody for sharing your time and attention with us today. Let's jump right in. Now, as I said, we are seeing a great deal of change and opportunity. So I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to talk a little bit about what their organization is and some of the challenges that they've experienced over the course of 2020. Dr. Shin, let's start with you. Could you please introduce us to Sutter Health and the challenges you've faced over the course of 2020? Thank you, Maribel. It's great to join everyone. Uh, Sutter Health is an integrated delivery network in Northern California. We serve over 100 diverse communities with 14,000 clinicians and 53,000 employees. Um, and it's a great opportunity to, to serve our community. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Chen, that was great intro. Uh, Sean, could you pick up and tell us a little bit about what's going on at Kraft Heinz and what you've experienced? <clears throat> I'm Sean Flaherty, and I, uh, I'm currently the head of technical services. I previously was uh, the head of uh, manufacturing for Oscomar. I've been with Kraft Heinz for over 30 plus years, working across the supply chains, both internationally and domestically. Kraft Heinz is 150 years old. We make some of the most beloved products consumed by all of our employees. And we have made some major big brands. We have Kraft, we have Heinz, we have Oscomar, Planters, Bagel Bites, Orida, Classico, Kool-Aid, Philadelphia, Jet Puff, Maxwell House, and that's just to name a few of them. My current role, I'm in charge of technical services, as I said, which includes engineering, maintenance, capital spend, transformational manufacturing, maintenance, and all the uh, productivity uh, pipeline that goes with that. Certainly a very wide purview for a big product line. Uh, Jen Brent, HPE, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Thank you, Maribel. Appreciate it. So hopefully everyone is is familiar with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, our our main mission is really to advance the way that people live and work through technology. Um, and one of the ways that I'm supporting the company, I work for the Global Real Estate Organization. Um, global real estate is is obviously a sort of a key area of focus for everyone um, uh, these days. Uh, you know, given the the COVID nineteen impacts that you're speaking to Maribel. Um, HPE has over 200 sites globally. We operate in over 50 countries um, with an employee base of over 65,000. So what we're really focused on right now in real estate is how do we sort of take what's happening right now with COVID-19? How do we advance, you know, the way that our employees or team members live and work? How do we sort of capitalize on this particular situation and think about what the future of work looks like? Like, and how we start to design for and deliver that now. Um, so that's really what, what me and the team are focused on. Great. So um, I'm going to pick up with Dr. Chan because, you know, it is COVID-19 and there's been a lot going on in the healthcare industry. Clearly, um, you know, in your case, could you talk a little bit about what happened when COVID hit? What kind of plans did you have to develop? Because it really wasn't business as usual. Uh, thank you, Maribel. Yes, and indeed, you're right. It's uh, business is not usual, but frankly, it's something in healthcare we've always had to face, whether it regards to fires or other disasters. Um, this is a unique time for us to be in, involved in the most intimate parts of people's lives, and this is no different. 
Um, let me let me harken back to a story actually, I think which will illustrate the point. Uh, so I was in clinic on, in late February and saw two patients who drove straight from the airport to my clinic. They had respiratory symptoms. Their daughter was concerned about their health. And uh, I got, got advance warning. I had been reading about this thing called COVID. And so I had to wear a, a mask, gown, a face shield, you name it. And I realized then and there that we had a unique challenge that was confronting us here at Sutter Health, which is how do we protect the patients and our, our clinicians as well? So. Um, during the week of my birthday, actually, we um, marshaled up a, a group of people, over 200 folks, many of whom I've never met to this day, actually, came together and designed a telehealth strategy to rapidly uh, respond to COVID. Uh, we took, we typically, we, one of the things we were doing is telemedicine, and prior to COVID, we had 20 video visits per day on average. And after COVID-19, we saw up to 7,000 video visits per day. So the mm -hmm. ramp up was tremendous. And uh, it was over, we were essentially given this challenge over a four week period, instead of a two year roadmap, which is what our initial intent was, we trained over 4,700 clinicians to deliver care virtually to meet the challenge. That is simply amazing and shows the power of both the will of individuals and technology coming together to make amazing things happen. And I imagine, Sean, um, in your case, you probably had, while well, different, something similar in the sense that it's food manufacturing. It's not something that can easily be done remotely. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been experiencing during COVID-19? <clears throat> yes. Um, so as you said, manufacturing is not something that's done very easily remotely. And so we had to quickly address the pandemic and make sure that our operation could stay intact and make our uh, employees feel safe and healthy and make sure that that happened. I mean, across our manufacturing facility, we have put in, um, we require face masks, we require health check assessments, we require uh, temperature checks before anybody enters our facilities. We put digital signage up across the facility to encourage social distancing. We've taken our break rooms and redid those so that there's uh, social distancing inside with plexiglass. We staggered our uh, break hours, our lunch hours, so that people don't congratulate um, in, inside there. And then we also have mailed newsletters to every employee's home in both English and Spanish to promote the self di social distancing and wearing face masks outside of work so that they can protect their communities and their families. We've limited visits to a plant to one person per week. And that person can only go to a plant once a week. We've done team meetings. We've done team meetings inside of our plant to promote social distancing. We've done lots of activities inside of a manufacturing place to ensure that our people are safe and that they go home the same way they came. And we don't have any transmission of the virus inside of our facility. I think this is so critical because you want people to be able to go to work, to feel safe, and you know our food supply chain depends on that. So uh, really excited with the work that you've been doing and, and very happy that you were able to do it. Uh, Jen, I, I know that HPE has manufacturing, but I would like to talk about something slightly different with you because I think you have a mixture of employees. So you're in real estate. How are you thinking differently about what to do with the employees? And you know, some people are calling this a hybrid work concept. Uh, what has been your experience with COVID-19 and a global workforce? Absolutely, Maribel, thank you. So you're absolutely right. We've got a blend in terms of our workforce. We have your sort of knowledge-based workers um, as well as you know manufacturing-based workers and also essential support, IT support workers. Um, and those latter two categories have continued to use our offices um, as part of the essential workforce throughout COVID-19. And so we've implemented very similar sort of safety measures, um, social distancing, you know, PPE use um, and the like. But as we're thinking about what the future of work looks like and really wanting to leverage all spaces and, and sort of reconceptualize or reimagine, as many people are saying, the future of office, um, we're thinking a bit more broadly. And so as a company, we are um, in, in the midst of a, of a strategy transformation to become the edge to cloud platform as a service company that is the leader in the industry. Uh, similarly, we wanted to think about 
at our strategy in terms of our workplace in, in a similar way. And so we're framing it as the edge to office experience, where f- by the edge, we mean anything really that is outside of the office. So that might be your home office, that might be a customer site, that might be, you know, working on a train on your way to the office for a cafe. Um, So we're really trying to think of the workplaces everywhere. And how do we really design for that? How do we design for a flow um, of a workforce that's really moving and working in a space that at that particular time or moment or day best suits their, their work? So we're really tackling this in terms of four key areas right now. We're looking at what is that experience at the edge? What do we need to make people feel comfortable, for people to feel safe and connected? How are we then adapting our offices? How are we pivoting those so that they are um, they really sort of foster use by a, a much more fluid workforce um, and that they're really fostering collaboration and social and connection? Um, Then we're looking at the digital experience being that sort of bridge between spaces um, and that sort of equalizer where everyone has a really similar kind of experience, has the ability to engage. Um, And that it's that piece really that is so core to our culture and ensuring that we continue to have that really strong cultural um, element that is core core to HPE and I'm I'm sure um, to Sutter Health and to Kraft Heinz as well. Um, And finally, really the mindset Um, Because I think anytime you move into something like hybrid and you have some people that aren't in your physical proximity, how you engage with them is is incredibly important. Um, And so I think what's what's most exciting really for us as a technology company is the the sort of the key the key uh, part or or piece that technology um, plays in that. Where you know in in the past workplace technology and and some of these other pieces collaboration technology may have been seen as more of a nice to have. Whereas now it's really an imperative um, in in our view for you know to really support the future workplace. I, I know when we were just talking with Sean, it sounded like there was quite a bit of communications and collaborations that had to happen with the employee base to make sure that they were up to speed on all the changes that were happening in terms of what their work environment were was going to be uh, and how it will change going forward. Um, now, on uh, Albert's side, this also makes me think that um, you know, we talked about this tremendous amount of visits that you started doing with telehealth. Can you talk a little bit about the changes of how that might have changed what the worker environment was like? Because I went from seeing a lot of patients in person to doing a lot of telehealth. Any other changes that you had to associate with this COVID-19 shift? Well, th- thank you, Maribel. I think the biggest change is really our belief in what we could get done. So mm-hmm. In, a, in other words, a, there's, there's always a fundamental belief of what you can achieve, and we've pushed the limits, and we keep pushing it. And, it, and really, it's been great, quite gratifying, actually, to see our, our employees, our staff, our, our clinicians be able to step up to this challenge and feel empowered to do so. So we are, we are seeing new models of care. We're seeing, uh, for example, patients, uh, I, 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 for example, I diagnosed a hernia, believe it or not, via video, which is, I'll leave the graphical image aside for a second. Uh, um, it was an incredible, incredible feat. And, and I thought, I never thought in my career that I'd be able to do this, but certainly you can. Um, and we, this, this you can attitude has really changed the, our culture. So as I mentioned earlier, we really marshaled up about 200 staff members to come together, many of whom have never worked together, frankly, to pull this challenge off. We changed our training methodology. We, for example, instead of doing in-class classroom training, we essentially held five sessions per day for four weeks straight so that we could um, accommodate the doctor's schedules and get people ready for telemedicine, for example. Uh, one of the things we needed to do was get equipment out to our doctors. So we provisioned centrally in, in a socially distant safe manner um, several thousand, four 4,000 plus iPads, for example, so that we could deploy them, so configure them centrally, deploy them locally to all our clinicians so they could connect to their patients. And the impact was felt almost immediately. We had stories from physicians who said, hey, um, I had a, a family, for example, who was really concerned about their baby and I, I diagnosed a, a neurologic disorder via video, for example. Um, in fact, one of our doctors was quoted as saying, you know, this is, this is, life has changed so much from COVID-19, 
we're, sort of, we're seeing this differentiation between BC before coronavirus and AC after coronavirus. And care will never be the same again. So it's an incredible transformation. I'm excited for the transformation that we've had because I think it'll bring care to a lot more people more seamlessly, which I think is fabulous. Now, Sean, we talked a little bit about what's going on in your manufacturing environment in terms of adding things like social distancing and, and other protocols. Were there any other manufacturing changes that happened as a result of that or any other challenges that this new environment created? Uh, yes. So <laughs> as people started to eat more at home, we had to change our whole uh, manufacturing network as uh, to retool because we service restaurants on the go. And those two segments started to drop off. People started buying more of the trusted brands that they are used to. And so we had to retool across our manufacturing network in order to make more products that people wanted that was in high demand. We increased our capacity across many of our segments. We focused on sanitation to production processes while still ensuring our highest quality of products. We've concentrated on lean flow and, and lean flow management inside the facilities. We have put uh, challenged all of our operational assumptions and made sure that we get the most output that we can during this time. I mean, some of the, I think there's four key things that we've learned during this. It's our, our speed, agility, our adaptability, and our repeatability. And th those four things have come to better ways of what better ways of working, increased efficiency, greater flexibility, and better focus on what the customer really wants. It's actually tremendous to think that you can change a manufacturing line like that, that you can be that re that responsive to shifts in demand. And I think that that, um, that whole concept, we've talked about business agility, if you look at it in healthcare, if you look at it um, in a mixed blended environment, like what's going on at HPE, or if you look at it in manufacturing, uh, we've always discussed it, but we, we didn't necessarily have that huge imperative and push to get it done as fast as we've done this time. So it's it's wonderful to see that uh, with the right vision and the right technology, you can actually pull these things together quite quickly and continue to evolve and adapt them as you see different changes in the marketplace. Jen, I, I wanted to circle back for a minute because you were talking a little bit about this edge to office initiative. And uh, how do you think that changes the employee experience? It, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think it, it changes it in many ways, and in many ways, we're gonna we're gonna hold on to you know our our sort of primary core beliefs and behaviors um, and the way that we operate. I love you know the example of of sort of the the art of the possible. I mean, one of our sort of col core cult cultural beliefs, sorry, is um, is the power of yes, we can. Um, and I think that this what's been so fascinating and and heartening about um, you know this context and and the in the previous two examples is people are just surprised at what they've been able to do about, you know, whether that is, you know, entirely changing a manufacturing line, whether that is, you know, taking an entire patient diagnosis uh, kind of service entirely digital. I think that people are really becoming um, exposed far more than they have been in the past to the truly to the power of technology and what we can do. Um, and from an employee engagement perspective, you know, HPE, as much as we've had a a pretty flexible way of working um, where, you know, in the past we've had people working from home, certainly. The core of our culture is, has always been site-based. And I think what's been, what you know, what we've sort of been shown through the past sort of six, seven months is how much connection you can really establish uh, virtually. You know, it may never be a, a wholesale replacement for what you're able to do in person, um, but the the kind of community feelings that we're able to, uh, to develop, I think the personal connection and we're letting people into our lives a bit more than we would have um, otherwise. But we're really seeing a lot of adaptation, um, a lot of you know uh, efficiency gains um, from certain people. I think a lot of folks had preconceived ideas about not being productive at home, and I think that you know, barring some of the the, the sort of unique circumstances of COVID, I think that's really been flipped on its head. Um, so I think you know, from an engagement perspective, productivity, efficiency, um, I think you know, it's very similar to the 
prior two examples, what we're seeing is, you know, rethinking the way that we all work and being more sort of fluid, relying more on technology is actually showing us that we can do things differently. Um, and in a way that actually allows people to work a lot more flexibly in ways that that suit their own personal style without necessarily, you know, seeing any kind of negative impact on, um, on output, but actually in the reverse, you know, really seeing an accelerated positive impact. Wonderful. So to close out, um, I'd like each of you to tell me what's the number one thing you've learned in the last nine months of this experience, and how do you think you can use that learning going forward? Uh, perhaps we could start this time with Sean. Yes. I think the, um, the one thing that we've learned, and we started the journey, was really creating a culture of we versus I. And the, and the other thing that I think has really been important during this is management style and leadership style. I think I've had to change my leadership style from one of a servant leader because we're not in the plants now to be able to mentor and coach people hands on to one of what I'm going to call intentional leadership. Intentional leadership to me is visibility. You still got to be seen. You still got to be able to do things. So you got to use teams. You got to use virtual FaceTime. You got to do something to make people feel engaged. You have to build trust. And remember, and this has gone on for nine months and it's going to go on, continue to go on. A lot of the people you've never really met in person yet. You have to have clarity. I think before we set goals at one to three years, now it's 30, 60, 90 days because the environment keeps changing around us so fast. Diversity, you have to be very intentional about being diverse and who you select on your team. Exclusivity, people still want to see you, still want to hear you, and they still want to be seen, and they still want to hurt. hurt. Courage, it takes courage to speak up. It takes courage to create clarity. It takes courage to create a diverse team. It takes courage to create, uh, to lead in these chaotic times. So that's really the kind of the biggest takeaways that I've had out of the COVID. Thank you. Jennifer, you want to add anything to that? I love everything that Sean just said. Um, and in so many ways, it mirrors all of our key themes that we're thinking about in terms of, um, you know, the goodness that we want to take from the past few months um, and and really apply to our, our go forward strategy or even emphasize. Um, I guess the one the one that I would add, I think it, it it's probably like encompasses so much of that is really just having a bold, you know, the, the sort of power and believing in bold moves. So I think what's been so exciting is that we had this really quite bold idea of moving to, you know, the future is a hybrid um, from a workplace strategy perspective and really seeing that embraced um, and, and being pretty early on uh, in terms of a company that was developing that strategy and now seeing that, you know, a lot of our, our sort of competitors or peers are coming out with very similar vision statements. Um, I think that that's really been a key learning and that's been something that's, you know, that's cultural to HP. PE, but really the, the power of that kind of vision is, you know, having a sort of bold idea and going for it. Awesome. How about you, Albert? Final comment? Gosh, how do I beat these two? This is amazing. Um, I think for me, it's really an affirmation. So if I think about healthcare, it, we have this unique responsibility and opportunity, privilege, if you will, to be in, involved in the most intimate uh, times of patients' lives. And I've been so hardened by the commitment of our teams, of our clinicians to be approachable, reachable, even in this face of the pandemic and all these things we're all concerned about each and every day uh, that we're committed to our patients. And, uh, and as evidence of that, for example, uh, I'll cite our net, net promoter score for video. Our net, pro net promoter score for video is 82, which is on par for our in-person clinical care. And it, that, that to me reaffirms the, the power of relationships to connect to people and to care for people when they need us to care for them, to empower them. And whether it be the pace of change, which we've adapted so quickly, or, um, or just our ability to can do, you know, and will do, um, it's really an affirmation that we were committed to helping people in their daily lives. And uh, it's just an affirmation of the power of people and relationships. So um, it's been a really heartening time for all of us. Thank you all for such compelling and inspiring stories. I'm sure the audience will take away many tips and tricks on how to turn challenges into opportunities and strategic advantage moving forward. And now I'm gonna turn it back to the cube for the rest of the show.